Cars come and go, but few last and remain as popular as the Mustang. The Mustang isn't just a car, it's a lifestyle. Its fans have created a phenomenon that continues today. In the early 1960s, research showed that people under 25, single people, and those buying second cars wanted a sportier car, and that baby boomers would soon represent 55% of the car buying market. As Lee Iacocca said in his autobiography, this was a market in search of a car, not the other way around. It helped that Henry Ford II also wanted a sports car to challenge Corvette. Further supporting this concept was Ford's public relations department that was continually receiving letters from people wanting a sports car like the original two-seater Thunderbird. To build his youth-oriented car, Iacocca decided to hold a competition among his designers, who were split into four teams. On August 16, 1962, it was a white-painted clay model nicknamed Cougar, designed by Joe Orris, Gail Halderman, and L. David Ash, that wowed everyone. It became the Mustang II prototype and remained basically unchanged from model through production. Only the frontal area, tail section, and most importantly, the name were changed in the production car. As they say, the rest is history. April 16, 1964, all three television networks ran Mustang commercials like these during prime time, quoting directly, Coming April 17th, the unexpected, the Ford Mustang. For Americans who want bucket seats, stick shift action, who want the elegance of a European touring car and until now had to settle for basic transportation. This is for them. This is Mustang. With an unexpected variety of options, Mustang is the one car designed to be designed by you. Get ready to meet the unexpected April 17th at your Ford dealers. Mustang is only days away. The next day, 2,600 newspapers carried advertisements or articles. It was a cover story for Newsweek and Time. The latter dubbed it a Ferrari for the masses. At the New York World's Fair, April 17th, the Mustang made its debut where it was a major hit. It was shown as a hardtop and a convertible. Initially, they came with three engine sizes, the 170 cubic inch, 101 horsepower straight six with floor-mounted three-speed manual gearbox, the 200 CID one barrel, and the 260 cubic inch, 160 horsepower V8, and Ford's Cruisomatic three-speed automatic. Another available option was a vinyl covering for the hardtop. This is one of the 1964 and a half debut cars. The number 260 on the side forward of the front wheel opening denotes the engine size. Another totally original 1964 and a half convertible with the 260 engine. A fake air intake in chrome accentuates the scoop. In June 1964, the high performance 289 V8 appeared. This would become the most popular engine. It had a 10.5 to 1 compression ratio and a single four barrel carburetor. Soon afterwards, the 260 was dropped and the 170 was replaced by the 200 CID inline six. Wire hubcaps were optional. Behind the front wheel opening is the word Mustang, preceded by a red, white, and blue vertical bar with the galloping pony cast on top, 
which always faced front. The reaction was pandemonium to Mustang's sporty, youthful style. Ford dealers had to close their doors because of the crush. A Mustang was sold by lottery because of the demand, and the winner slept in the car until his check cleared. A truck driver mesmerized by the car in a San Francisco showroom plowed through the window. There just hadn't been anything like the Mustang. It was the right car for the right time. A sports car with a back seat. It had the power and styling of a sports car, but room enough for a couple of friends. It appealed to the young and the young at heart. These wild Mustangs have become symbolic with the car. John Conley at the J. Walter Thompson Advertising Agency came up with the name after researching animal names at the Detroit Public Library. Ford continued to pique America's interest with its commercials. Mustang, Mustang's coming, April 17th, the unexpected Ford Mustang. The hardtop was advertised as practical, economical, but beautiful. The sporty convertible stressed the optional rally pack and optional high-performance 289 V8 engine. The vinyl top version was touted as elegant, but affordable. In some 1964 commercials, Ford proudly boasted that Tiffany & Company, so renowned for elegance and style, had given the Ford Mustang its coveted gold medal award for excellence. The commercial also pointed out that it was the only time Tiffany had given an automobile an award. Not even Ferrari or Porsche had been so honored. Lee Iacocca insisted it cost less than a dollar a pound. It weighed 2,500 pounds and cost $2,368 FOB Detroit. Well, America went Mustang crazy and generally paid well over the sticker price because it was so in demand. 100,000 were sold in the first four months, 1,000 a day in 1964. Frank Sinatra and Debbie Reynolds, among other celebrities, ordered one the first day. The fastback named the 2 Plus 2 appeared in September 1964. A 1965 fastback with the high performance 289 V8. This was a great engine originally designed by George F. Stirrett in 1958. It went 0 to 60 in about 12 seconds, had fuel consumption around 17 miles to the gallon, a top speed approaching 110 miles per hour, and could run 100,000 miles or more without trouble. The deluxe optional steering wheel, studded with 18 bright recessed dots and brushed spokes with 12 circular holes. The fastback came with functional air extractor vents. The Mustang commercial suggested owning one could change your life and make you younger, wilder, and freer. Mustangers could take on the cavalry and beat them. A staid librarian dreams of Mexico, gets into her Mustang, lets her hair down, heads south of the border, and becomes a matador. The timid became brave, the weak strong, and the sedate became wild. When you became a Mustanger, bullies couldn't push you around anymore, and you could take on the world. This 1965 Mustang GT has been completely self-restored by its original husband and wife owners. After the car had been out for a while, Ford Research discovered 71% ordered V8 engines, 80% wanted radios and white wall tires, but only 50% ordered automatic transmissions, and one in 10 Mustangs were ordered with the rally pack. Nineteen sixty-five was the first year for the Shelby Mustang. Carroll Shelby was a legendary race car driver and engineer, and his Shelby Mustang GT three hundred and fifty was really a street legal race car. Built from the stock Mustang fastback, it was heavily modified. The two hundred and eighty-nine V eight engine was hopped up from two hundred and seventy-one to three hundred and six horsepower, and had a four-speed manual transmission, heavy-duty suspension, larger wheels, and tires. A fiberglass hood, functional scoops, vent windows. Twin racing stripes and pins were added to the body. At first, it only came out in white with blue stripes. It also had no back seat. Shelby's relationship with Ford had started back in 1962. Ford had failed in its attempt to buy Ferrari, but managed to make an agreement with Shelby. 
1959, Carol Shelby was on the Aston Martin team that won the 24-hour Le Mans race. Consulting his doctor for chest pains, he was advised to quit racing. Well, he decided if he couldn't drive them, he was going to build them. In 1962, AC Cars Limited in Surrey, England, who had been building lightweight sports cars in limited numbers for 35 years, found themselves in financial difficulty. Shelby recognized an opportunity when he saw it. He managed to convince both Ford and AC Cars Limited in England that he had an agreement with the other party. He told Ford that he had bodies ready for Ford's 260 engines, and then told AC he had engines looking for bodies. Later, he managed to pass off the only car he had as several different ones by painting it different colors for the car magazine editors to test. Everyone was convinced they'd seen several different cars when actually it was always the same car. In fact, the very first car anyone saw wasn't painted at all. There wasn't time, so they just scoured the aluminum body until it looked perfect. In its first race against Corvettes, it was one and a half miles in front and increasing its lead when a broken axle took it out of the race but everyone took notice. None of the early Cobras were identical since Shelby and AC kept trying to make improvements. Shelby suggested AC round out the shape, which they did. People said it looked like a Cobra ready to strike. The story goes that Shelby dreamt up the name one night and saw it written on a piece of paper on his nightstand the next morning. In 1963, Ford came out with a four-barrel, 271 horsepower, high-performance, 289 cubic inch engine. Naturally, Shelby started using this engine. The Cobra was designed for those seeking ultimate performance. Shelby's legendary Cobras intimidated everyone on the race course. And then, as high-performance production Mustangs, they attracted a large following. They epitomized power and speed and oozed brute force. These magnificent machines are GT40s. In 1966, with Shelby guiding Ford's performance division, he won the Le Mans race with three of its GT40 Mark IIs in the first three positions. He beat Ferrari on its own turf and left Corvette standing. These 1966-style GT40s were built in the 80s in England using the original molds and carry the original serial numbers from an unfinished early run. The great sports cars always use race car engineering and styling. In commercials, Ford boasted that the Ford GT had stunned the world in international racing competition at Le Mans, Daytona, and Sebring. And then, out of this laboratory on wheels, had come the high-performance GT production car. Distinctive with Mustang GT stripes, fog lamps, five-cluster instrument panel, sports steering, front-wheel disc brakes, heavy-duty stabilizer bar, flared dual trumpet exhausts, and 289 cubic inch four barrel V8 engine. The 1966 Shelby Mustangs had a rear seat, smaller wheels, more color choices, and an automatic transmission was offered as an option. Although few ordered it, a Cobra Paxton supercharger engine was also available. The rear side window was plastic for that one year. Hertz ordered a thousand GT350s, they came in black with gold stripes, and on the side it had GT350H. However, these Shelbys came back with definite signs of racing, so Hertz dropped them. Shelby always used a real wood steering wheel. This is an extremely rare 1966 Shelby Mustang convertible. Only six were made that year at the end of the production run. Four as gifts from Shelby to friends, and two kept by Shelby America for demonstration and office use. The six convertibles all came in different colors, red, black, green, blue, white, and pink. This red one originally belonged to Shelby America, and they put the optional chrome Magnum 500 wheels on it. In 1966, Shelby Mustang production was 2,380 units, including 936 Hertz cars and the six specially built convertibles. All six convertibles had air conditioning. Three were automatic, and three had four-speed transmission, which this one has. Not only is this a beautiful and powerful automobile, it is also an expensive one due to its rarity. The engine was the standard Shelby 289 Hypo engine. The convertibles didn't have the racing stripes on the hood and deck lid, only the thinner side stripes with the GT350 designation. The side scoop, which ducted air to the rear brakes on the regular Shelbys, was non-functional on the convertibles because of the convertible mechanism. 
Mustang became the flagship of Ford's performance program and succeeded in changing Ford's image from conservative to youthful and aggressive. Recently, faithful reproductions of the Shelby convertibles have been created. The standard 1966 Mustangs come off the production line, showing that over three million have been sold. In 1966, the front grille had thin horizontal chrome stripes with no heavy chrome bars attached to the horse corral. Rocker panel moldings became a $16 option. This 1966 Mustang GT has the blacked out grille, longer nose, and GT stripes. It came with the five gauge instrument panel, optional eight track tape deck, and comfort control. Also pony emblem floor mats. The GT had a heavy bar attaching to the horse corral and fog lights. Adults weren't the only ones who wanted a GT of their own. Kids could order this accurate, battery-operated scale model. The horse logo on the front was originally designed to run to the right the way racehorses run. But in the final version, it runs to the left, which is only proper for the free-spirited Mustang. When Lee Iacocca was asked about this mistake, he replied that it seemed headed in the right direction. Sales definitely supported that thought. Ford still boasted of its limitless options. The best way to appreciate the beauty of these details is in newly restored Mustangs. The magnificent embossed horses on the seats are appropriate for a car nicknamed the Pony Car. This original beauty contains Mexican Mustang cigarettes, possibly named after the car, and the splendid sporty trunk with Mustang bag and wheel cover. This 1965 restored fastback has the sporty trunk, Mustang cigarettes, toy replica car, and embossed horses on the vinyl seats. A 1966 hardtop GT parked in front of a 66 convertible. Everything on this hardtop is completely stock for the GT package. Ford was spelled out in chrome block letters across the front hood from the 1964 models on until the 1968 Mustangs. This beautiful 1966 convertible has the $16 aluminum rocker panel option, radio, and optional 289 V8 two-barrel engine. It has nearly 300,000 miles on it and is driven every day by its original owner. It was originally dark green. However, this is a new, hardier metallic paint that matches it. It came with the optional wire hubcaps. It's lowered and has 15-inch wheels rather than the 14-inch it came with. A 1966 Fastback with five vents and the GT insignia and stripes. Ford introduces the 1967 Mustangs. The sleek fastback with its steering wheel that adjusts to nine different driving positions. The hardtop available with the six or any of four V8 engines. Now the chrome bar across the center of the grille attached to the horse corral. 
The 67 was 2 inches longer in the nose and 2.7 inches wider. The indicator lights were recessed in the hood. The roofline of the fastback swept from the windshield to the tail in an unbroken line. It had 12 vents instead of 5. It had a concave housing for the three rear tail lights. All GT cars carried the GT emblem on the gas cap. The side simulated scoops were keyed to the body color, not chrome. The GT automatic was designated with the lettering GTA on the rocker panel stripe. This modified 1967 convertible is one of 1,209 that came with front bench seats. The interior console layout was refined. Total production for 1967 was 472,121. Hardtops were still by far the most popular. 356,271 were sold, as opposed to just over 71,000 fastbacks and 44,808 convertibles. In 1967, the Shelby had softer suspension, power steering and brakes, and fold-down rear seats. Shelby offered a GT500, which came with a 428 cubic inch engine. The Shelby would only last to 1970 due to disappointing sales. However, it is the early original Shelbys that are coveted today for their engineering, style, and value. The Shelby GT350 won the Sports Car Club of America's coveted B Production Championship in 1965, 66, and 67. The Cobra insignia had become the symbol for performance. Carol Shelby. Here in 1968 in a Ford commercial, Carroll Shelby talks about his Shelby Mustang. To build my kind of car, I had to take an existing car and modify it. I could have chosen any set of wheels I wanted. I picked Mustang. Mustang is style right, lean and strong looking, not fat and round. And Mustang has that long list of features and options. I'll tell you, when it comes to imitations, I've seen some, but competition for the original, I haven't seen any. Only Mustang makes it happen. These aren't just words, it's a fact. This red 1968 Shelby Mustang convertible has a voice-activated snake sitting on its engine. This was the first year the production convertible was available. Until 68, Shelby had made only those six special convertibles in 1966. The 68s included a built-in roll bar, and production was moved to Livonia, Michigan. Snake Charmer is a 1968 GT350 with 365 horsepower and the optional Paxton supercharger. It is still owned by its original female buyer. The 68 Shelby Mustang had a wider fiberglass nose jutting out over the bumper and wide mesh grills set back into the front cavity. In 68, the GT350 and GT500 had their best sales year, totaling 4,450. Prices ranged from 4,116 to $4,450. GT500s were almost twice as popular as GT350s. The KR stands for King of the Road. This Shelby GT500 has a 428 Cobra jet engine. This is one of only 40 cars painted yellow in 68. The poised Cobra adorned the gas cap and the front fenders. For the standard Mustangs, the 1968 changes were minimal. There were no chrome bars attached to a smaller running horse on the front grille. Gone were the letters spelling out Ford across the front hood, and the block letters used for Mustang behind the horse on the fender were changed to script. There were still three body styles, hardtop, convertible, and fastback, but the number of models increased to 10. This is a California special with the plain grille, fog lights, no Mustang emblem, stripes, and styled along the lines of the Shelby Mustang. 1969 had major style changes. 
a dark gray mesh plastic grill, all metal before 1969, smoother, non-sculpted sides. It was a tougher, no-nonsense automobile. Ford considered the term fastback old-fashioned and started calling it a sports roof. The 1969 interior was redesigned with an emphasis on safety. Henry Ford II had snatched Bunky Knudsen and stylist Larry Shinoda from GM. They would depart together after a couple of years, but their influence would be felt in the longer, sleeker Mustang of 69. The big news that year was the introduction of the Boss 302, Boss 429, and the Mach 1. Most 69 Mach 1s came with the 351 Cleveland V8, but this beauty has the powerful 428 Cobra jet, which made it one of the fastest accelerating cars in the world. This was the largest engine available on a Mach 1 in 69. This has a 100% factory stock engine, just polished valve covers. The hole in the hood accommodates the large engine without raising the entire front deck. The engine was rated 335 horsepower, but actually puts out 410 stock right from the factory. Its color is royal maroon, one of only 36 made that year. It has side air scoops. Slats on the back window and the rear wing were options. Ford commercials emphasized the Mach 1. The 69 had the side roof Mustang medallion. It had racing pins and stripes similar to the Shelby. Ford shows up close the vibration of the Cobra jet engine. 72,458 Mach 1s were produced in 69, of which approximately 13,150 were 428 Cobra jets. This Calypso Coral Boss 302 is all original as it was delivered to the Ford dealer in 1969. The engine has been rebuilt, but with original replacement parts. It has the 302 Hypo four-barrel engine with 290 horsepower. There were only 1,623 of these manufactured. The 302 engine hit 60 in six seconds, and it replaced the 289 V8. The 1969 Shelby Mustang GT was also redesigned. It had metal circling the front grille. The KR identification was dropped, and they were now manufactured on the same production line as the regular Mustangs. Carroll Shelby announced the end of his involvement with Ford. In 1970, Mustangs won the SCCA Trans Am Championship. The 70 Mach 1 cost $3,271 and weighed 3,240 pounds. This stunning 1970 Mach 1 with the My 70 Ford license plate has a 351 CID Cleveland V4 engine, FMX automatic transmission, 9-inch rear end with 3.25 to 1 ratio, power disc brakes, power steering, factory air, deluxe interior with tachometer. Everything is factory stock except the special yellow paint, flow fit seats, and seat belts. The introduction of the Boss and Mach affected Shelby sales. In 1968, 4,450 Shelby Mustangs were sold, but only 601 in 1970. This Calypso Coral Boss 302 four-barrel, eight-cylinder engine Mustang came with competition suspension, quick ratio steering, Magnum 500 chrome wheels, tachometer, four-speed transmission, power front disc brakes, and a radio. Rear slats and spoilers were now available options on all Mustangs. Another Boss 302. Boss Mustangs came in striking colors. These three are Grabber Orange, Grabber Blue, and Grabber Green. This is a Boss 429 built to comply with NASCAR race rules, which required 500 cars be manufactured and offered to the public. Only 1,300 were built, and they carried the NASCAR tag on the lower edge of the driver's door. It was a highly modified version of Ford's Thunderbird and full-sized car engine. It had a huge functional hood scoop. This 1970 is one of 10 California cars built. The battery is in the trunk, 
There just wasn't room in the engine compartment. It also helped weight distribution for racing. The 1971 Mustangs anticipated the public's desire for more luxury and bigger, longer cars. The grille cavity was as wide as the car, and the fastback, or should we say sports roof, extended all the way to the rear, earning the description flatback. These are Boss 351s, which were only made this one year. 1,806 were produced. The 1971 Mach 1 with the 429 Cobra Jet Ram Air engine. It has the automatic C6 transmission. It's been entered in four shows so far and taken first prize in all of them. Looking uncannily like a Mach 1, a red 1971 429 Cobra Jet Mustang convertible. Only about 1,300 cars were built with the 429 engine, and only about 100 of those were convertibles, so this is a rare car. Fully restored back to original condition, it was trimmed out like a Mach 1 and could have been called a Mach 1 convertible, but Ford didn't. Red with matte black stripes, power windows, air conditioning, Magnum 500 wheels with the same tires that were offered that year. Muscle cars were losing popularity due to insurance costs and emission standards. Sales dropped to 125,093 in 1972. However, sales for Pinto were over 347,000. By 1973, the oil crisis had car manufacturers worried. 73 was also the last year for the convertible for 10 years. The 1974 Mustang II was smaller, with a four-cylinder engine as standard and a six as an option. The Mustang II changed little between 1974 and 1978. In 1975, the 302 V8 was offered as an option and developed 122 horsepower. By 1976, Ford was planning a new Mustang. Ford had bought the Cobra name and in 1976 offered the Cobra II. The engine was 302 single-barrel V8, rated at 139 horsepower. At first, only available in white with twin black hood stripes and a rocker panel stripe, carrying the Cobra II insignia. Different color combinations were offered in 1977. The 77 Ghia showed off luxurious interior and moonroof. The 1978 Mustang commercial stressed price less than 77. To celebrate its 15th anniversary, the horse reappeared in Mustang commercials in 1979. Aerodynamics became important. Since low drag factor enhanced fuel economy, wind tunnel testing, a total of 136 hours in all, was extensive. The engine choices remained the same as for the Mustang II. The four-cylinder engine was standard, but now a turbocharged version was offered. Four-speed manual, four-speed manual with overdrive, V6 and V8 only, and three-speed automatic were available. 332,025 units were produced. It was selected to be the 1979 Indianapolis 500 pace car. So here the Mustang takes the oval at the Indianapolis Speedway. 1979 was also the year Lee Iacocca was fired. Little changed in 1980. Here, Mustang takes on Porsche to prove it can match it in acceleration, cornering, braking, etc., and all at an affordable price. In 1981, power windows and T-bar roof style were options. In 1982, under the grueling desert sun, Mustang takes on the Camaro and beats it in 7.3 seconds. Ford continued to remind its public that Mustang originated from race car design and engineering. And in fact, the very first Mustang prototype was a two-seater race car. This 1962 documentary, The Mustang, shows us the evolution of that first Mustang prototype from idea to illustration to finished model. This prototype was originally named Mustang after the World War II fighter plane. However, the horse, a less warlike symbol, would become its namesake. After many preliminary drawings, they come up with the final design. Clean entry, stylized roll bar, and functional air scoops on the sides. The emblem is first created on paper, then in clay and wood, and finally in metal.
The special body was first developed in clay, starting with a wooden frame called an armature, over which hot modeling clay is pushed and formed. When cool, the clay is perfect for sculpting. From this, a fiberglass model is created. It's then subjected to wind tunnel tests, which confirmed the car's aerodynamic body and proved the effectiveness of the side vents. The aluminum sections are checked carefully against the fiberglass mold for accuracy before being welded and joined to the frame. After final additions are made, the car is tested on a track and is clocked at the Daytona Speedway at 120 miles per hour at a comfortable 6,100 RPM. Sterling Moss, the famous race car driver, introduces it before the start of the American Grand Prix at Watkins Glen. Car and Driver was the first of many magazines to recognize Mustang's engineering and styling innovations. At the University of Miami, students are enthralled by the Mustang prototype, showing the dual exhaust system, turn signals, and stoplight. The Mustang emblem is the rear deck latch. The engine has a single carburetor, high-speed cams, 11 to 1 compression ratio, 60 degree V4 block on 92 cubic inches. The lights swivel for night driving. The license plate can be down for regular driving or up for racing. Although Ford believed there wasn't enough market appeal for the Mustang prototype, this dream car would evolve into one of the most successful cars ever built. During the 1980s, Ford boasted the boss is back with five liter high output engine. In 1983, Ford showed the boss being forged at its own steel factory. Back in 1964, Ford announced that it had become the first car manufacturer to build its own million-dollar steel-making facility, a new factory to produce the exciting new, unexpected Mustang. In 1983, the convertible reappeared. The turbocharged SVO was touted by Ford in its 1984 commercials. The 1985 Mustang SVO, intercooled four-cylinder turbocharged engine with 175 horsepower, promised you the power of eight cylinders and delivered. The changes between 1985 and 86 were minor. This red 1987 GT is raced by its owner. It comes with custom stripes and special painted wheels and six Coney shocks. The car has been lowered and has the whale tail, a 302 supercharged 400 horsepower engine interior saline flow fit leather seats and an incredible sound system that includes nine speakers. In front of it, a black 1988 Mustang GT Fastback, which has many custom details including whale tail, tail light treatment, and horseplay license. An all metal hood, custom rims, wider tires, and it's been lowered. Today, as in the past with Carroll Shelby, a race car driver, Steve Celine, has helped create the high-performance Celine Mustang. This Celine is very rare indeed. This 1988 is the only one with Conley leather, and one of only two that are automatic. It has a 302 engine and 225 horsepower. In 1989, Ford and Mustangers decided to celebrate their 25th anniversary in a big way. Mustang enthusiasts from all over the world made 1989 a year-long celebration, and on April 16, 1989, converged on various locations around the country to celebrate the birth of the most successful sports car ever, the Mustang. They came from as far away as Switzerland and picked up fellow Mustangers in France, Scandinavia, and England. They called the caravan the Great American Pony Drive. They boarded a ship in Southampton and after arriving in Florida, drove cross country to Los Angeles, picking up American Mustangers along the way.
At the Knott's Berry Farm Ford Show, thousands of Mustangs and over 100,000 car fans were brought together. There were rows of early Mustang convertibles, hardtops, and fastbacks, rows of Shelby Mustang Cobras, Bosses, and Mach 1s, and even rare Shelby AC Cobras. They came in every color and from all over the world. A sampling of some of many beautiful Mustang details. Ford sometimes made changes during the production year or used a different hubcap or part when none of the original ones were available. So sometimes you'll hear someone comment that a particular part wasn't on that year's car, while its original owner will swear it came that way. All of which makes for good conversation between Mustang experts. Mustang lovers are a varied lot. Some are purists who won't change a single detail. Others are into heavy modifications. Some love the old classics. Some love the muscle cars. But they all agree on one thing. They won't be trading it in any day soon. Like all true legends, there are always those doubters who are sure it won't last, and those who don't think it should. But the Mustangers, those people who never let the legend die or be retired, created a phenomenon. Most cars are ultimately discontinued, and more than once Ford thought about it, but the reaction was so great the Mustang could never be put out to pasture. On any given weekend, anywhere in the country, there's a Mustang meet taking place, where collectors, restorers, and fans get together to celebrate a car that's a legend. Mustang. Wow, thing I think I love you. But I want to know for sure. Come on, hold me tight. You move me. Wow, thing. You make my heart sing. You make everything move it. Come on, hold me tight.